Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm uh, Kurt Krayler. I'm the curator of the Masterworks exhibition uh, here at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I'm a former student, uh, undergrad and graduate studies. I graduated in 2016 um, and have been invited back to curate the Masterworks exhibition this year. Um, so I thought we would have a, a discussion just around some of the themes in the exhibition. Um, and we'll start with short presentations from each of the panelists, and then we'll proceed with a discussion afterwards. So thank you for joining us tonight, and thanks to those of us online that are joining in as well. Uh, yeah, so I'll start with a land acknowledgement. So I just wanted to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded uh, indigenous territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee's people, on whose land we have traversed and occupied and worked on throughout the course of our studies. Uh, it's also important to notice that uh, September 30th, next Saturday, is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, so please take the opportunity to familiar, familiarize yourself with the 94 uh, calls uh, for action and reflect on how you can have uh, an impact through your own work as well. Uh, I think it's also important to acknowledge existing context as we're going to be discussing here today. Uh, so it's vital for architects to consider the history, perspectives, and teachings of Indigenous communities um, through our works uh, and our efforts towards reconciliation. Uh, so I'll begin with my thesis uh, called The Generic Spectacle um, and how it plugs into the current uh, exhibition. I'll provide a brief overview of the context in which my thesis was developed and the methodology I used uh, to study the history of development in Las Vegas and came up with the, the term, uh, the generic spectacle, to theorize this uh, history of development. So Learning from Las Vegas was released in 1972 uh, detailing the work of a studio at the Yale School of Architecture under the guidance of architects Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, and Steven Eisenhower. Uh, it was an attempt to examine and document an architecture that had developed outside of all conventions and matter of taste. Through various drawings and documentation, the role of the sign and its relationship to the increasing popularity of automobiles uh, became evident as the key drivers for this new form of architecture. Roadside signs were a byproduct of this emerging fossil fuel economy uh, since they were visible over vast distances and could be seen by approaching vehicles along a long stretch of highway like the Las Vegas Strip. Venturi and Scott Brown produced a number of studies as seen here that documented and analyzed the size, scale, and configuration of signs and their respective buildings. They observed that the roadside sign had surpassed buildings as the key factor in attracting visitors and communicating the purpose of the building's function. So uh, in Learning from Las Vegas, they defined two terms. So the first was the decorated shed as a way to describe the increasing prominence of the sign while the building was relegated to serving more pragmatic functions like shelter and program. So these diagrams show two different versions of uh, what's described as the decorated shed, one where the sign sits by the road, while the other depicts the sign laminated to the building face. So the duck is the other um, term that was coined in learning from Las Vegas, and this refers to a building where the architectural systems of space, structure, and program are submerged and distorted by an overall symbolic form and this type of uh, building becoming sculpture was called the duck in honor of the duck-shaped drive-in, as you see here, uh, known as the Long Island uh, Duckling, and it was illustrated in God's Own Junkyard, a book by Peter Blake. So that's where the term the duck comes from, where the sign has taken over and become the building itself. So in a follow-up to uh, learning from Las Vegas, architect Rem Coolhaus conducted an interview with the original authors, and he noted that learning from Las Vegas constituted a manifesto for the shift from substance to sign, deciphering the impact on substance uh, and culture. French theorist Guy Debord would initially identify this shift in the Society of the Spectacle, which was released in 1967, 
around the time that documentation was being done for learning from Las Vegas. Uh, and he was referencing Karl Marx's capital and the increased influence of the image in modern society. In it, Debord declares, uh, the spectacle is not a collection of images, rather it is a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. And I like to think of social media as a contemporary version of the society of the spectacle and how our relationships are navigated through images, the sharing and the viewing of images. Um, he also notes that the spectacle is capital accumulated to the point uh, where it becomes image. In an analysis of Debord's work, Anselm Jab summarizes that the spectacle is characterized by a subsequent downgrading of having and to merely appearing. So noting the increased reliance on images to generate capital, and that's where signage really starts to come into the conversation. So let's see how this manifests through the architecture of Las Vegas. Uh, we start here with the, the golden nugget, um, which is an example of the decorated shed as initially identified by Ben Churi and Scott Brown in 1972. Um, and it, this is a, an example of where the sign is either applied to the building uh, or separate as a roadside sign. So here you can see it's quite large uh, in relationship to the building and it's affixed on top of the building. Uh, and again, we have a, a more contemporary version of the duck than the actual duck in Long Island. Um, this is the Luxor Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Um, and we can see how the building has become the sign itself its form communicating the, the function of the building, which is a pyramid-themed casino. And then sign is atmosphere. So this is where I started to theorize about the development of buildings and the relationship to signage in Las Vegas following the study uh, that was initially published in the 70s. Uh, and so it's progressed now that the sign has become an atmosphere, uh, as demonstrated here at the Venetian Hotel, an interior space that is meant to signify the actual thing. And then even more recently, the sign as city. Um, so shown here with the city center development in Las Vegas, where the entire hotel casino resort signifies a self-sustaining cosmopolitan city, even though it's not actually, it's a, a casino and a hotel. So nobody actually lives here, uh, but it, it appears to be a city. So drawing on the works of Guy Debord and cool, uh, Ram Coolhouse, I propose the concept of the generic spectacle to help describe this evolution in architecture, building a theoretical framework to help analyze both the development of Las Vegas, but also other urban downtowns across uh, the United States. Um, the generic spectacle would eventually come to occupy other American urban centers where the perceived desolation of the center provided a figurative tabla rasa, despite the presence of those who remained, uh, demonstrating a fundamental element in the establishment of the generic spectacle. So the center does become occupied uh, through this powerful convergence of capital and consolidation of ownership monopolization uh, to the point where it becomes an image signifying the real thing. The generic spectacle requires constant renewal and destruction to build bigger, better, and flashier developments in a bid to att and attract investors and visitors. So in Las Vegas, these are four uh, casinos that we see here that have been spectacularly demolished to make way for bigger and better uh, buildings. Uh, in a bid to uh, salvage some of the cultural history of Las Vegas, um, the Neon Museum has become a stand-in uh, and showing the signs that have a lot of meaning attached to them uh, as a way of communicating the historical uh, memory of the city um, and communicating that to visitors who pass through you can only view the museum through guided tours where they tell you the story behind some of the most prominent signs and what it meant to the community. So after my thesis, I continued uh, my research through my work at ERA Architects, which is a firm that specializes uh, in heritage preservation and adaptive reuse. Uh, the office is an architecture and planning firm and works across uh, Canada, uh, focused on the conservation of historic places through their reactivation. We work with both public and private sector clients uh, to develop creative adaptive reuse 
and heritage planning strategies across all eras, types, and styles of architecture, uh, from small-scale houses and major industrial campuses. So another approach that we've taken as an office to heritage conservation when a building cannot be salvaged or through other means uh, is through publications, um, and it's a, a creative uh, approach to heritage conservation. So we have some publications here that were previously published by the office. Uh, so we have Concrete Toronto, which documents the city's brutalist architecture and communicates its value. Uh, the Ward, stories about Toronto's first immigrant neighborhood and Housing Divided, a series of essays about how mid-rise development could be the key to solving Toronto's housing affordability crisis. So that's where the signs that define Toronto comes in. Um, so I'd initially proposed the idea for the book to principals within the office um, as a way to tell the stories of signs and capture the life and culture of the city of Toronto through its signage it became apparent that signs are a reflection of the society that it advertises to uh, in a way that architecture and building styles may not be able to communicate. So through my historical research at the office, I was seeing a lot of images of the city uh, before a lot of sign bylaw ordinances were coming into effect and recognizing a lot of signs that had been removed um, and wanting to know the stories behind them. So the book covers all different types of signs that are organized into eight different chapters in chronological order based on uh, signage technology. So we start with the earliest painted signs in the first two chapters, and then get into the more electrified signs of the marquee and neon signage. Uh, and then for contemporary signage, decide to focus on three different neighborhoods in the city. Uh, so we have Chinatown, Little Jamaica, and in the suburban chapter, we also feature uh, Toronto's Iranian diaspora, uh, Toronto, which is just to the north of the city. Uh, then the book ends with um, a chapter on the future of signage, and we focus on Young Danda Square and the use of LED screens as a version of signs. Uh, so interspersed amongst the various chapters of different signage types are features of iconic signs and how they came to be and where they ended up. So including Honest Ed, um, Macombo, The Real Jerk, and Sam the Record Man. I also wanted to incorporate case studies from the ERA archives. So we, I had access to a lot of the drawings and historical research uh, that we were doing within the office. So I thought it was a great way to show the process of sign making. Uh, and we even interviewed um, several sign painters, a sign maker, Dizzy Minot, um, we interviewed uh, photographer Tanya Tiziana and also our very own uh, Linda Zhang, who will be presenting a bit later today, uh, who talked about her work with Chinatown. Um, and I wanted to end with this image uh, from Denise Scott Brown. So when it came to curating this year's Masterworks exhibition, uh, we wanted to feature projects that engage with existing communities and propose an architecture that responds to an existing context in a sensitive and considered way. So just how I had traced signs and a way to examine an existing uh, neighborhood, um, Denise Scott Brown's proposal uh, for an intervention on South Street in Philadelphia, um, rather than proposing a new building, she actually proposed a banner which would advertise uh, the existing community and just enhance it ever so slightly but also remaining very sensitive to the value of the, the community that existed in that space. So a call for submissions was uh, issued for the Masterworks exhibition, um, and we wanted, after careful consideration, to take into account uh, student projects that really considered their, their context of an existing community. Uh, so we'll start with David Ogby's proposal for a renewed temple of Afrobeats in Nigeria, providing space for performance, education, communal gathering. And then Weenie Lin's uh, concept of Chinatown as heterotopia, using Foucault's uh, heterotopias to theorize about the development and history of, of Chinatown in Toronto. Emily O'Neill's extensive interviews with sex workers for a proposed multi-use and multi-purpose building uh, that responds and seeks to address the specific needs of the community in Vancouver's east side. And finally, Kelsey Mallott, um, 
whose analysis of ephemera from LA's Sunset Strip, including flyers, billboards, and music venues, uh, in a response to restoring um, the Sunset Strip, the Viper Room. So the exhibition is on display until Thursday, so be sure to check it out before it closes. Uh, you'll also have an opportunity tonight to come by uh, after to see the exhibition if you haven't had a chance to do so. And finally, the Signs That Define continues as a living document online uh, through our Instagram, where we continue to post content that didn't make it into the book, uh, but as a way to continue to tell the stories uh, of various signs uh, in the city that we're still receiving to this day. People are reaching out and sharing their, uh, their photos that they have of, of historic signs in the city. So be sure to follow us to, to see more. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over to Linda. Uh, who will be presenting her work on Chinatown 2050. Hello. I'm so much shorter. <laughs> okay, I think it's working. Um, so I'm going to share about a project called Reimagining Chinatown in 2050. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of this, the history of signs uh, in, in Chinatown specifically. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of context about the project uh, and then kind of turn to its relationship to architecture. Uh, so this project came about um, in 2020. Uh, we were supposed to have a symposium in April 2020 um, about Chinatown and its heritage. Um, and it, it was supposed to be in person. So obviously that got canceled. Um, and all of the panelists, we kind of came together to think about if we wanted to do something else uh, during this time. Um, it was with my Museum of Toronto and they were uh, very supportive and offered you know, a more uh, financial support and honorariums if we wanted to put something else together as a as their first digital program in the pandemic. Um, so the thing that we kind of came to respond to was kind of this moment of heightened anti-Asian race, uh, racism and sentiment that we were seeing in the news and media. Um, and it also included a kind of like idea of how Chinatown and the kind of a Toronto Asian community was expected to behave in response to this, uh, which was as a model minority. Um, and so it felt like the future was kind of narrowing and at the same time there's a lot of concern for the future um, of, of Chinatown. Uh, so we thought having a speculative fiction writing workshop uh, that was just open to community members uh, would be a great way to kind of uh, break from this narrowing future and kind of open it up in a more expansive way. So these are all of the community facilitators. Um, and in the workshop we had, uh, we capped it at 50, um, 50, 50 slots so that there were uh, 10 people per two facilitators. Um, and it was open to anybody. Um, it, the idea was that you didn't have to be a writer to join this. We um, started, um, we prioritized recruitment to uh, Chinatown community members and we also gave the workshop uh, bilingual uh, in case anyone who wanted to use you know, Mandarin or Cantonese um, language instead. Uh, and it started out with a kind of collective uh, world building exercise where in groups everybody kind of reimagined what a world might be like together. Um, and those questions centered around questions uh, of change, uh, who seeks change, who seeks to prevent that change, and are others in the world seeking different kinds of change. Um, so this also is sort of an acknowledgement of, of the, the richness that is Chinatown where nobody agrees with each other, um, and that is actually the kind of uh, the beauty of it, that in that difference is kind of where we find community. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that um, we were uh, very fortunate to um, have um, access and the privilege to share uh, the worksheets that actually from uh, Adrian Marie Brown and Walida and Marisha, um, who are uh, two uh, black and brown organizers that, um, and um, Amory, Adrian Marie Brown's actually an Octavia Butler scholar as well. Um, so they had put together this anthology that we were really inspired by called Octavia's Brood, where they asked um, basically uh, organizers to write speculative fiction stories. So they're not, not authors, but people who are just reimagining things every day in their organizing. Um, and so uh, the two editors uh, have this belief that science fiction is organizing and that everybody can take um, part in science fiction. Everybody can imagine science fiction and therefore everyone can be an organizer. Um, so that was very much the spirit of, of the workshops um, that we were offering. And so from those um, 50 initial story writing um, 
several authors, we, we didn't have any expectations for producing anything, we just wanted to offer this space. Uh, but many authors asked us to continue giving writing workshops, and so we did, um, did so, uh, and that has uh, come out as an anthology with nine uh, stories in it. Um, it just launched this summer, we're actually having a book talk um, this weekend at Art Metropole um, at 2 p.m. on Saturday, if you're around. Um, and uh, so that's the kind of history and context of this project. Now, over to architecture. <laughs> um, so actually, how do I, let me see. Okay, so of course, in all of these stories, um, Chinatown is kind of like a character in many of these stories, and the protagonists encounter it in different ways uh, where it sometimes uh, estranges them or makes them grapple with their identity in different ways. Um, so one of the things that uh, we did was we uh, started building all of the stories uh, as architectural worlds, um, as, as initially as, v as VR worlds um, in Unreal Engine, um, and we built them out of 3D scans um, that we took of Chinatown during lockdown um, in, in May 2020. And we recollage them. So in this case, this author um, imagined a Chinatown where, in 2050, Chinatown gets um, socially distanced from from Toronto and is placed on Toronto Island. Uh, so if I go back to the beginning, you'll see. Um, hold on, Ooh. Toronto very far uh, in the distance. We'll look we'll look back around and you'll be able to uh, kind of see it far off. Um, and. It's about a young girl who's grappling with kind of having to arrive in this in this place uh, where she also feels on display, and yet this is supposed to be where her community is. Yes, yeah, so you see the Toronto <laughs> distantly in the island. Um, and she has been told in history books what this place is, and it's very different from uh, what her family thinks or what her mother thinks, and her mother actually initially forbades her from um, being able to visit this place that her mother does not believe was built for them. Um, And so uh, we, I quickly realized that the um, VR <laughs> space was not a great way to um, show these stories. Uh, so we actually ended up um, animating a short documentary film um, where we can, can take uh, folks through with a specific uh, camera movement, but also um, in the film playing as interviews with the authors that tell us uh, about, about their stories. Uh, this story is called Hot Pot Politics, where there are uh, three Chinatown -town organizers who are mind-linked with telepathy, and they're trying to fight cultural developers uh, who want to make uh, a certain kind of future Chinatown -town in their cultural development practice. Um, and in all of this, many of the questions that the authors are grappling with are around um, the history of displacement um, in Chinatown and a kind of historic um, emergence of Chinatown as a resistance to this continued displacement. Um, so this is the first piece of Chinese uh, North American architecture that exists. Um, this is the Chinese Village and Theater Pavilion at the um, Chicago uh, Columbian Exhibition from 1893. Um, so uniquely, um, most pavilions are built by the country's um, country of origin. So usually uh, the Chinese government would fund this pavilion. At that time, it was the Qing government. They actually withdrew because, um, as you might know, one year before, in 1892, America um, uh, created the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned uh, immigration uh, to the US. And so as a protest, the Qing government boycotted the expo. So why does this exist? Um, this was actually built by uh, Chinese, the Chinese that were in America at the time, um, and they saw architecture as a strategic way to actually mediate relations. Um, so basically, like the signage of the facade that they're going to present, they wanted to design something that would make Americans not feel afraid of them, that would make them appreciate their culture, that would kind of convey um, a sort of understanding and try to bridge uh, bridge across these cultures. And so the first piece of architecture ever built by this community, that's what it was trying to convey. That's the whole point of it. And you can see here, um, they're writing to um, the editor of the Chinese American kind of like newsletter is writing to their, all of their constituents saying, come fight for your rights, because they're literally, you know, like this is the time where they're like really getting kicked out of the country. Um, in 1907, we have the anti-Asian riots in in Vancouver, that last three days where people's stores and, and people are literally getting beat up and marched out of town, right? This is a time when there's a lot of 
uh, a lot of uh, anti-Asian sentiment and also fear that in Vancouver it started in Chinatown, the second day was in Japantown. Um, so it's like literally come fight for your rights by building this piece of architecture, it is worth half of your, your salary just to come see it, right? Like that's, that's the urgency um, and role that architecture played. Uh, and then we see this hap translate in Chinatown. Um, so one of the earliest Chinatowns uh, in North America is San Francisco. And so this is 13 years later. There's a great um, earthquake in San Francisco and it burns um, Chinatown to the ground. Uh, and so before you can actually see that um, there isn't as much signage uh, in, in San Francisco Chinatown, but when it's rebuilt, we kind of see this very characteristic uh, Chinatown with its pagoda roof lines with its overly animated um, street signs. Um, and this was actually a, a strategic choice because uh, when, <laughs> after the earthquake, the city wanted to uh, build Daniel Burnham's um, City Beautiful plan instead of uh, rebuilding Chinatown. That was actually the same architect, I forgot to mention, who designed the master plan for the expo. Um, so the expo was actually nicknamed the White City because all of the buildings were white of a uniform height, style, and character. Um, and then everything that was not white existed in the midway, which is that little um, linear strip that extends. And it was organized from black to white. So the Irish and the Germans were the closest to getting into the white city, but they weren't allowed in yet. Um, and the village uh, theater and pavilion is where the red dot is. And so um, in San Francisco, <laughs> same architect, uh, we want to the master plan to kind of beautify the city. But beautify is what we understand as not in a town at that time. And so the uh, Chinese community actually came together at that time and they hired a team of white architects to rebuild Chinatown. And this was led by Bernard Maybeck. And they specifically wanted a Chinatown that wasn't authentic to China. Um, and China didn't look like this at that time. Um, they wanted a Chinatown that would be palatable, would help mediate relations, would gain more acceptance, and that everybody else in San Francisco would love it so much, they would let, they would let them stay. And so this is the history of where our signage comes from and, and what our signage does um, in these spaces. Um, and it's interesting because I think a lot of, um, even uh, like Asian, Asian folks and seniors who come to Toronto, um, they often ask like, why doesn't, why doesn't our Chinatown look like that? Why does our Chinatown look uh, so different from the other ones? Um, so I think one thing to remember in our timeline is that in, um, 1947, city council moved to expropriate Chinatown, which used to be located where New City Hall is, in order to build City Hall. 1947 is the year that the Chinese Exclusion Act ended in Canada. So the year when you could finally start having immigration, um, they decided to bulldoze two-thirds uh, of Chinatown. Um, but shortly after that, as immigration started, there was also, of course, a need for Chinatown. There was a lot of organizing to keep a Chinatown or relocate it somewhere. So eventually that moved to Chinatown uh, West, which is at Spadina um, and Dundas. Uh, and then a, th a fourth uh, Chinatown, because, sorry, this is, the f I guess, the old Chinatown. Uh, before this one, there's actually an early Chinese neighborhood um, on York Street, south of Wellington, that got burned down in a fire and then got re redeveloped into Union Station. Um, so similar story a few, a few earlier. So I call it the fourth Chinatown, though it's the, the third official Chinatown is Chinatown East, which emerges in 1971 um, in response to immigration beginning from mainland China um, and a disproportionate kind of like access to wealth between those coming from Hong Kong and Taiwan at that time and mainland and, and a need for more uh, affordable access to rent. Um, so here we can see early Chinatown, old Chinatown actually has some of these iconic signs. It was a really vibrant neighborhood at the moment they decided to demo the whole thing. Um, and this sort of typical um, architectural uh, collage technique of just cutting out the whole neighborhood and, and this became um, the, the image that was included in the um, competition uh, like files to be like, design something for this neighborhood that doesn't exist already, even though everybody is here. Um, and so this is kind of the only um, site in Chinatown West that really had that style of sign. Um, this was the um, Xinhuang Center, also um, known as Bright Pearl. Um, and it originally was, in 1913, built as a labor lyceum. This was a Jewish neighborhood. Um, and so there was a lot, a lot of history around labor organizing that happened here. Eventually, in um, 1971, they moved to Cecil Street, and they sell this to a Taiwanese restaurateur. Uh, 
uh, who opens this restaurant. <laughs> Um, many, there are many, many different restaurants that have existed here uh, in this kind of building facade design. Um, it is reportedly haunted. There's been a whole bunch of exorcisms. For some reason, the businesses never survive. Um, and then in uh, 2018, it was bought by MetroCorp, um, and it was renovated into this, which I understand as a sign of speculative real estate. <laughs> Um, and uh, it went from being a building that had multi-uses and multi-tenants um, to renting the four stories out um, for one. They wanted one tenant. So it actually, from 2018 until last year, it sat empty. Um, and they finally got a tenant in there um, this year. Uh, and so this is kind of, um, I just did an anti-displacement tour for um, a, a Chinese seniors organization who's Chinese seniors against anti-Asian racism. And this is kind of the site that we used to explain, like, this is what gentrification looks like. Like, this is what people think about it getting more beautiful. But like, this, is, this, this was all created um, not thinking about people or inhabitation or space. This is all about money. How do you make more money? They don't want to deal with more tenants. They don't want to more. They'd rather have it sit empty <laughs> for three years. Um, and also, they know that they can get a higher rent if the outside looks like this and not like Bright Pearl. Right, so this is, this is kind of what those symbols mean. Um, it's interesting in the context of Chinatown because Chinatown actually has provisions that allows for more street signage um, than in other neighborhoods. Um, and I, it, this, I find this uh, particular amendment from um, 1980 uh, very hilarious. Um, I thought to myself, like, if I was a lawyer, like, like, what would have been the reasons I would have put this in? And, like, I really can't come up with <laughs> any logic to it. Uh, but they declared a very small part of Dundas Street an area of special identity, um, and they made a provision to encourage the emerging Chinese motif, um, which they define as illuminated signs, street furniture, and architectural detail, um, which I just take to mean that the person writing it really had no idea what this was. So here we go. Um, and this is um, another site, which now this photo is already a historic photo, which pains me, because I used to be able to do this tour and only hold up, hold up that photo. And now I have to hold up both, because it's just a gigantic pit on the ground now. Um, but this was a kind of classic um, strip of um, restaurants, the, you know, dentists, optometrists, all of these places that you would access um, in the neighborhood, um, and the iconic Rolsan um, dim sum restaurant has moved across the street, still exists. Um, and then this was the kind of um, proposal uh, from po po uh, Podium Developments to uh, redevelop it. And uh, initially, same issue again, where like ground floor, single retail. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of organizing with Friends of Chinatown um, to kind of like come to an understanding of what cultural competency means, um, of how do you keep, uh, how do you give access to small businesses to still be able to uh, return to this space. Um, yeah, so uh, there is, I, I, what I'm trying to kind of get at is sort of like the visual architectural language of gentrification and displacement in Chinatown um, and the kind of role that architecture and signs um, actually also uh, plays in that. And there are many kind of misconceptions um, and especially as we do this work with um, non-English speakers, um, so concepts that we might understand as gentrification or even just the Chinese translation of gentrification, um, they don't always... Uh, have a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, so we kind of talk about what does beautification mean, what does um, cleanliness mean, who is Chinatown for, um, and in this sense of like, you know, what, what does a sign look like when the sign is for a community um, versus what does a sign uh, look like when the community is strategically using a certain style to be able to fight for their right to be there um, versus what is a sign that's just a sign of money. Um, and in all of this work, um, the last thing I just want to end on is um, I want to point out that there is actually a, a strong history of organizing in Chinatown. Um, and there's been a strong history of um, working against the speculative real estate market in Chinatown as well. Um, and these are through what were called tongs, which is family associations. Um, and so there would be a uh, family association that would buy, come together, many members, they'd buy a building together, and it would be at the place where they could meet, where they could decide um, what to do with it, but it was also the place where like, it would become your bank because you weren't allowed to have access to a bank in Canada. It would become how you'd find a place to rent. It would become how you'd have your, kind of, your own, own network, and they all have their own kind of unique signage. Um, and many of these buildings are still owned by family associations, 
And so it's kind of like a very early version of what we would now call a community land trust. Um, it's being held by this group and trust. And the thing that I also want to point out is like the family associations are by last name. Um, and the, the name is deceiving because you're not actually family, right? Like you're like, if you just share the last name, it's like the last name Zhang is like the name like Rob. Like there are so many of us and we're not related. Um, but the idea of the family association is like you've come all the way here, you don't know anyone, you need support, and we make kin out of nothing. Um, and so you arrive here and you can just go to your family association. The Chan Association is going to have a mid-autumn um, festival party in, in two weeks, and literally anyone, as long as you have the name Chan, you can come and eat for free. Um, and so how, how we are now continuing this work um, is we just launched the Toronto Town of Townland Trust um, this summer. Um, so we are kind of formalizing it, we've, we've incorporated, and we are kind of currently seeding capacity to be able to like purchase property um, and kind of continue this, this work of the family associations, which today are less used. Um, it's, it's more of like, a, uh, there are less youth involved in family associations and the buildings are starting to far, fall into disrepair and we need ways of kind of maintaining community ownership. Um, because in Toronto, in Chinatown, um, we already, th so through our tenant um, surveys, uh, we have found that there are several large land assemblies already happening in Chinatown, so the kind of turn is 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 rather urgent. Um, and so that's kind of, I think, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of share with you like a way to think about um, signs and identity and symbols and how that ties to um, really capital and displacement and, and the right to remain um, through a kind of like one particular um, neighborhood. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay. Well, okay. Excellent. Oh, thanks so much, Kurt. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks uh, very much. I want to say, Kurt, for uh, introducing me to We Need Lynn's work and giving me an opportunity to reconnect with Kelsey Mallott and David Ogby and Emily O'Neill's work. And uh, I felt like I should just say, David Ogby's work kind of memorialized Fela Kuti, and uh, I think that's like a very important uh, name to mention. And uh, uh, I also yeah, really enjoyed working on with Kelsey on uh, the Sunset Strip and the, the kind of reverberations that has for kind of your urban experience. Um, so I only have uh, five slides, and I, um, I'm just going to talk about recent work. Uh, and recent work is kind of wrapping up um, what happened during the pandemic when we spent a lot of time looking at screens. And uh, this is uh, a series of four or five images about uh, issues uh, that relate to documentary film, uh, documentary film that uh, addresses urban and landscape issues, uh, documentary film that addresses urban and landscape issues uh, largely emanating from the continent of Africa because um, some of you might know that there's been predictions that the um, scale of growth and urbanization in Africa will be one of the kind of major um, uh, events uh, of this time in the, the century. So um, the four examples are uh, coastal erosion. Uh, we have coastal erosion in Canada too. So this is a case of coastal erosion in uh, Ivory Coast. And then uh, dismantling. The second is dismantling of a pavilion by Jean Pouvet. Uh, in two countries, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Brazzaville, and also in uh, Niamey and Niger. And then the last is a documentary on forests, a documentary that uh, promotes the thinking of the botanist Francis Halle. So, um, and then the last quick mention is that these are documentaries that all take the idea of docufiction so although they are mainly documentaries, and in a way uh, they make use of a documentary in a way that I think is very helpful in terms of replacing perhaps the 
lack of investigative journalism that can happen on these topics. And so in order to make the documentary more engaging to a more general public, often there's a kind of character, but you're really dealing with a, uh, a place and a time that's actually specific. So I forgot, is this going to make me go? Yeah, OK. So very quickly, this film uh, by the director, uh, Simon Kulubali Giard, uh, is about a uh, former peninsula, now an island. Uh, it's called the island of Lahukapanda, and it's at the mouth of the uh, river, major river that's uh, basically scouring it away. And so the um, film, this docufiction, takes this character, Aya, who does not want to move, and basically describes her kind of coastal life and uh, uh, eventually she ends up uh, migrating to Abidjan, uh, living with an aunt, um, basically because her village disappear, disappears, literally, uh, and um, they kind of struggle with it by making very, their houses movable, but it basically uh, removes the cemetery that's been there for 300 years, and uh, the other interesting thing about this particular ethnic group is that they speak a language called Avakam, and there's about 20,000 people who speak this language, and this is maybe the only film that exists where you can actually have a, uh, the entire film in this particular language. So it, it kind of also highlights the issue of the incredible mm, range of languages that you find on the African continent. Uh, so, um, the next example is, uh, you may have kind of tuned into this extraordinary explosion in uh, value, monetary value, monetization of houses. And one of the most odd and extreme examples are these 1949 uh, prefabricated aluminum and steel houses designed by the architect Jean Pouvet from France. And he managed to have three prototypes built, so flat packed and built, two in Brazzaville where there were uh, kind of a double house, you can see the two pieces, and one in Niami, and uh, they kind of were occupied by people for a number of years, and around 2000, a collector uh, sourced them out, uh, brought a team, dismantled them, flew them back to be restored in France, and they sold eventually. I won't mention the figures, but they're in the collections now of the um, Tate, the Tate mounted uh, the Brazzaville, one of the, so one of the two Brazzaville houses, and the Pompidou Center has the other, and I think the, the third is, they're still going. But anyway, the prices for these restored uh, originally, <laughs> Uh, demountable houses are, are quite extraordinary and kind of reflect this bizarre trend that we've experienced in, in many aspects of, of dwellings, uh, especially since the pandemic. And then the last example uh, is this uh, work by this botanist named Francis Halle, who has a very specific opinion about the forest. He's in his 80s now and, and uh, he developed a method of research that involves making these beautiful documentation drawings. So I wanted to include a drawing in the set of slides. And uh, he worked with a team where they would use dirigibles and um, balloons to create uh, uh, tents. So they called this the raft of the treetops. And then they would live in these treetops. This is, I, I think, the tall trees of Madagascar. And uh, they... Um, uh, produced the documentation in terms of photographic from these amazing uh, research trips. Also, they also worked in French Guiana. Um, I think this picture is actually from French Guiana, so in South America, but um, they started out um, years ago in Madagascar. And just to say that uh, it's a little bit dark, but uh, Francis Halle says that in his lifespan, he knew many, many what he calls like old growth forests, but from his point of view, there are really nothing, there's really nothing left, what he, he calls contemporary forests, plantations. So it's a little bit, it's a fantastic image, but it's a little bit of a dark vision in the sense that 
um, from his knowledge and experience, and he is a very kind of eminent botanist, um, we are really coming to the end of the uh, planet with, that has old growth forests. So those are just um, a few quick snapshots of uh, some of the documentary films that are coming about that are addressing urban landscape issues in, in our contemporary world. So thanks very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, so three very different uh, topics, I think. And I think what was interesting in our conversation before um, the presentation was just how much the pandemic uh, shifted our focus, our research. Um, so Marie Paul, I wonder if you could start with how the isolation of the pandemic and just like the, the change in research as a result of um, the pandemic really influenced your, your work. Yeah, I guess in part it was um, reconnecting with people who were also isolated in various places online and I kind of reconnected with another um, researcher who was working on uh, African cinema and documentary and docufiction issues. And um, the main way to diffuse those uh, contemporary films is through the film festival. So that person gave me access to some film festivals. Because one of the weird things about, you know, contemporary diffusion of images is that it's so strangely controlled. You know, your region zero, region one doesn't, you know, your player doesn't work. Similarly, you know, to get access to films, a lot of times they show in a festival and then you struggle to find them and, and often the diffusion and streaming. I mean, we're sort of in the middle of a strike of actors and writers partly because the system is not working right now very well and um, uh, we have trouble accessing. And so I'm finding that at least you can use screenshots from documentaries That's right. to kind yeah. of describe what's going on. But yeah, yeah definitely the, this is wrapping up like the search that, was, uh, that I was doing because during the pandemic it was highly limited you yeah. know, to get out and do things and go different countries was yeah. completely out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you could like travel through film in a way that you could explore other cultures. And, yeah, so yeah. It, I mean, in a way, there, there, it is true that these, these, this work is out there and uh, is, is really worth um, finding out about, I think. Yeah. And uh, Linda, you also use film. Uh, when I went to see Linda's work um, for the, the launch of Chinatown, uh, 2050, it was at Hot Docs uh, Cinema, and you started with a series of um, a film uh, interpretations of, of different writers' imaginations about the future of Chinatown. So I was wondering if you could talk about the decision to use that as a medium to animate their work. Um, yes, I'm also just learning about the whole festival circuit and this whole very strange, not totally uh, objective <laughs> way that you disseminate in that world. Um, so, I mean, the Chinatown 2050 project uh, really was in response to the pandemic. I think before that, a lot of my work was more historical. I was spending a lot of time in archives. I was um, trying to kind of, you know, like reconstruct old Chinatown, like see how we can learn from the past into the future. But the moment um, that we were in really called for uh, a different kind of future. Um, and uh, I think uh, I had never done anything uh, animated. I'd not worked in film before. I'm an admirer of film, but I like was just like I don't know. I, like I don't. I'm. I actually am, am typically um, very much uh, in the material physical making world. Um, so that in the duration of the pandemic, uh, when there was no other material that you could really work with, because your labs would be closed, studios would be closed, or you could only, uh, I actually had, had access to the lab that I was in, but you, we couldn't be two people at once, and how do you build something when you're just one person, like you physically can't lift a lot of things or do it. Um, and so I had all this time to just sit in Unreal <laughs> um, and animate these stories and, and play around. Um, and so I kind of, uh, yeah, it gave a kind of focus to a digital, um, platform that I, I normally, I think, would not have had the patience for <laughs> as um, someone who's much more physically inclined. Um, and it started out as p p being VR spaces, but um, we, d we did a launch a few years ago, I th actually no, I think it was just last year, um, at Nuit Blanche, where we, we kind of like did a VR launch. Um, 
And it just like, I mean, people loved it, but like no one got the stories. People just thought it was kind of like a cool space. It was very disconnected. Um, I think it, we kind of just got, um, it just, we, we ended up doing the film because there was no other way to tell the story. Um, but then similarly, you know, I was like, oh, I just want to upload it online for free so everyone can access it. And then learning that actually that's not how um, you get more people to access it. You kind of have to go through this festival circuit. A festival won't screen it if it's already premiered in that city or that country. Um, but at the festival premieres, it's like where you get the most people to actually see it. If it just lives online, no one sees it. And so there's still people who really um, want to see it and, and don't have access. So I just give them, you know, the like password link to the, the um, version that we have uh, because along this timeline you have to like kind of release it in a certain way and so I think in, in the conversation just around kind of like capital and like signs and, and access like there's a weird way in which like to make it accessible you, you have to like pay to go see it at a film festival when I'm like I could just upload it on YouTube for free but if I do that no one will see it and so it's, it's um, yeah it's kind of tricky yeah. dilemma. I'll just say too that um, there's something about film that does make it more accessible because it can be shared more widely. But the, um, we were having this conversation when we were talking about the book, and there's something that's a bit more tangible and uh, historical uh, about publishing a book, having a record um, that doesn't get lost in the ethers of the internet. So it's interesting how there's something about the accessibility of the internet that everything get, can get posted but then because there's such a wealth of information that it can get lost in the foray. So just having a publication is also just as important. And I think that's what you were doing with Chinatown 2050, um, was making sure that there was a physical component as well as having the, the, the documentary uh, film component. Um, and also I think what was interesting that you both were talking about was uh, speculative fiction um, and historical fiction as well. Um, so it's interesting to know uh, how it can be used as a way to encourage imagination because I was at the uh, film screening for Chinatown 2050 and uh, one of the panelists had mentioned how capitalism uh, tends to kill the imagination um, and in a way to get that imagination back and get people to think creatively uh, beyond the current system that we're under. Um, speculative fiction can be a way to, to encourage that, that uh, free thought. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, an interesting component, just noticing between both of your projects um, that that's what was uh, being encouraged. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if there's any burning questions in the audience. Uh, you're more than welcome to raise your hands. Um, I think we're getting close to the end now. There's refreshments in the gallery, so I uh, ask you to join us and you have a chance to see the show one last time before it closes on Thursday. Uh, we'll be there, so you can ask us your question then. Um, there's a, a bar, there's some appetizers, uh, so feel free to make your way over to the gallery. Thank you for joining us.